Uh, please welcome Martin Pauls. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for showing up for my talk today. I would like to start with a video. All right, so Ayn Rand spoke those words in 1959 in her very first TV appearance on the Mike Wallace interview. And I think if we look at those words from today's perspective, they might still be shocking to a lot of people. The idea, the approach of love which Rand offers here. But I think we also need to take the time into consideration. Again, this was in 1959, so in the post-war years. So what happened is that we had a situation of 
complete confusion and of fear because we are now entering the postmodern movement here. In the beginning of the 20th century, we had modernism. So the modernists, they were arguing against classicism, they were rebelling against it, against traditions, and they wanted to make it new, as Ezra Pound famously said. But they could reach no consensus whatsoever what they wanted to do and what was their common vision. So after the Second World War, we very much had a breakdown of all structures. People did not know where to go, and now we are entering the postmodern phase. And I will not go into detail here because we already had a brilliant talk on that by Professor Hicks. But the point is here that people did not know what they wanted from life. They saw the breakdown of all structures with World War II, and now they wanted to find something new, but they didn't know exactly what in this atmosphere of confusion. But I think the two ideas which at that time were prevalent in the United States of America were first and foremost mysticism, the idea that the United States was somehow special, and second, the ethical implementation of Christianity. Altruism, the idea that we have to sacrifice for others, even in the sphere of love. And if we look at Rand's quote here from this perspective of what she says in that interview, we can get a brief idea, I think, although not a clear one, of how this must have seemed in the, 90, in the 50s. She says, quote, every business has to have its own terms and its own kind of currency. And in love, the currency is virtue. You love people not for what you do for them or what they do for you. You love them for the values and the virtues which they have achieved in their own character. You don't love causelessly. You don't love everybody indiscriminately. You love only those who deserve it, end quote. It's very straightforward, and probably Rand's kind of confrontational style also didn't make her much more likable to the contemporaries of the 1950s. However, this what I just showed you, Rand's approach to love, which she offers to us in the Mike Wallace interview, is precisely the approach which I would like to defend today. In my talk, Values and Virtues as Spiritual Currencies, How to Settle and Enjoy Moral Transactions on the Marketplace for Love and Friendship. I have divided my talk into three parts. It will last for approximately 60 minutes, which will leave us 15 minutes for Q&A. So in the first section, the self in its mirror, I will focus on values and virtues. And I will highlight why values and virtues are necessary for love. And that in a twofold way, because as Angel already alluded to in her talk, both the self and the other need to possess values and virtues. And I will argue that we need to literally mirror them in order to have a worthy relationship, a virtuous love. And that leads me to the second point, what is that virtuous love? So I will give you some ideas how a virtuous egoistic love looks like in the objectivist sense, and I will get some misconceptions out of the way. So my key argument here is a, lo a romantic love in the fullest sense, in the selfish sense, is neither egoistic, uh, I'm sorry, is neither instrumental, nor is it a zero-sum game. And as you can see, we are already starting there with economic terms and applying them to love, and this will be the last part of my lecture. We will start developing an economic approach to love. I will talk about risk, I will talk about trade, and I will also apply the model of supply and demand to love. So let's start with the first section, the self and its mirror, values and virtues as prerequisites for egoistic love. I will start by analyzing this sentence, which Howard Rock utters halfway through the fountainhead. Quote, to say I love you, one must know first how to say the I, end quote. So I am obviously aware that Angel already gave a talk on this topic. And while I agree with everything that Angel said in the talk, I will have a completely different approach, a completely different framework. So there will not be much repetition, if at all. And to show you that I have a really different framework, we will now start with Aristotle's theory of motion. And I will explain Aristotle's theory of motion. And we will then apply it to that sentence, I love you. So Aristotle outlines the theory, most importantly, in the last book of the physics, physics book eight. And the first thing he points out is that everything which we see in the universe, which is moved, must be moved by something. Otherwise, there can be no movement. That is his starting point. He says, quote, all things that are in motion will be moved by something, end quote. Aristotle, in that section, he famously differentiates inanimate matter from conscious entities. And there are differences. If you have inanimate matter, let us say a stone. A stone has no consciousness. It cannot move itself. It cannot move from A to B. However, an external mover can come around and throw the rock, but there must always be external movement. As against conscious entities, animals, including man, which Aristotle says are self-movers, so they have an internal mover which makes them move. However, the point is here, if, for instance, Howard Rock in the Fountainhead comes up with the idea of a certain building, then he is a mover. He projects an aim into the future 
and he starts with spiritual movement here. However, Aristotle points out in such a case, one is not a prime mover, one is not an unmoved mover, because Howard Rock himself was moved, as you see in the first part of the novel, by Henry Cameron. He was inspired by Henry Cameron. And Henry Cameron, in turn, did not create out of nothing. He was inspired by someone else, and so on and so forth. But as Aristotle points out, when we have such a chain of movers, the very first one must be unmoved, because otherwise we will have uh, an infinite regress, which is not possible in philosophical terms. So he writes, quote, there must be some first mover that is not moved by another, for it is impossible for a series of movers, which are themselves moved by another, to go on to infinity, for there is no first member of an infinite series, end quote. So how do we come out of this dilemma? Because apparently every mover is at the same time moved, but the first particle must be unmoved. Aristotle says that the very first mover has two parts, a moved part and an unmoved part. In one minute, I will give you an example. For instance, if I move a table, then I myself, as the, as the mover, am in movement. But Aristotle says there's also an unmoved part in me. So he writes, quote, of the whole first mover, one part will cause motion while remaining unmoved. That's the unmoved mover. And one part will be moved. That's the moved mover. For only in this way will it be possible for something to be self-moved, end quote. So let me exemplify this theory now. Let us have a very, very Easy example, from the physical realm. Let us say, have a look at the sentence, I will move the table. A very straightforward sentence. So let us say, for instance, I want to exchange a light bulb, but I'm not tall enough, so I'm moving the table there in order to exchange the light bulb. Well, in such a case, obviously, the table is the moved entity, and it can only move, be moved by an outside mover, because it belongs to the realm of inanimate matter. So it cannot move itself. Consequently, in order for it to be moved, there must be movement. But the crucial point here, which Aristotle points out, is that there is no such thing as movement in and for itself in nature. The term movement, the idea of movement, only exists when there is a mover. So there needs to be an eye, which in this case moves, and in this case moves the table, ultimately. So the point here is the first thing I would like to stress, because this will become very important. Movement only exists if there are people who move something. There is no such thing as movement in itself without an entity that moves. That would be the platonic position, that movement exists intrinsically in the universe. Aristotle says, no, we don't see movement without a mover. So this is the point. The eye moves, and if I am moving the table, as you see on the illustration, I would move myself. But there is an unmoved part inside of me, which is my aim, my desire to move the table. That is stable throughout the entire process. That is unmoved. I want to move the table, and I'm doing it. So my aim to move the table moves me, the mover, to move the table. So that's a pretty straightforward example. But it becomes more complicated when we look at spiritual movement. And now we have the sentence, I love you. Now we can see, do the same analysis and say, first of all, here is someone who is moved. That is the you. That is the other. The other is moved by the movement, by spiritual movement, by the act of loving. But again, there is no such act of loving in the universe as such. It does not exist intrinsically. There is only acts of loving if there are lovers, if there is a stable eye. So again, the I comes first, and this is what Rock really says in the sentence, I think. So when we have the sentence, I love you, there is someone who is moved by an act of love. But in order for there to be an act of love, there needs to be a stable I, a mover, a lover who moves. And what makes this case even more complicated is that when I move the table, the, move, the table cannot move back because it's not a conscious entity. We are dealing with one conscious entity and one entity of inanimate matter. But here we are having two consciousnesses. And usually if you say, I love you, what you want to hear is, I love you too. So when I say, I love you, and I have a moved object, the you, the you can reciprocate. It can also say, I love you. And this is how love comes about. But in this case, again, we have an unmoved mover. If I express love to my girlfriend by kissing her, I am in movement. But my unmoved mover is my desire to express my love for the other, which moves me, the mover, the lover, to express my love. I could say much more about that, but I've written my second master thesis on that. So if you Google my name plus Aristotle, you can find it online. It's like 100 pages. So this is the crucial idea here. But the point here is the first takeaway, is there needs to be an I. There needs to be a mover. And if you apply it to spiritual realms, there needs to be a spiritual mover. If we apply it, narrow it down to love, there needs to be a lover. There can be no such thing as love without the lover. So here are the first things, the first two key takeaways, I think. Values and virtues are prerequisites for egoistic love. And they are so in a twofold way. As I said, first and foremost, the I, 
the lover, the mover, has to hold firm, stable values and virtues. And then, in order for the other person to become valuable, he or she also has to hold stable values and virtues, because otherwise, and I will give you an example from Rand's novel, Atlas Shrugged, later, there can be no love. So those are the two conditions, conditions which need to be fulfilled in order for there to be a genuine and worthwhile love. First, the lover needs to represent values and virtues, because otherwise, he or she has nothing to offer. And second, the beloved also needs to represent values and virtues, because otherwise there can be no harmony. And Ayn Rand is very clear on both those aspects. So first, as to the lover, I will not read out that quote, because Angel already discussed it in her session. But as she pointed out, there needs to be a lover who, as Rand puts it, holds, quote, firm, consistent, uncompromising, unbetrayed values. End quote. And this is a necessary precondition for Rand's conception of love. There needs to be a stable eye. But at the same time, we also want to find those qualities, those moral virtues and virtues reflected in the other person. So Rand writes in Atlas Shrug, quote, to love a thing is to know and love its nature, end quote. So look at that very short sentence, which I think is fascinating. First, we need to understand ourselves. We need to understand what is important for us. What is an important value? For instance, liberty for many of us. So then we need to get to know other people we need to identify what their virtues and values are. And we need to first understand that value is also, uh, that liberty is also a value for them. Only in this way can we understand the other and fall in love by what I will call in a second a process of mirroring. Leonard Peikoff has a very interesting passage in OPA and he puts together both points in regard to both the lover and the beloved. He writes, quote, the attainment of love requires a proper course of thought and action. It requires that a person define and validate the specific values of character and the hierarchy that he regards as important to him personally, the self. It requires that he recognize these values when he encounters them, which means that he learn to identify objectively the traits possessed by others, the other, and by himself, end quote. So here we see the union, which all this talk is about, the union between self and other. How does it come about? This is the question. And here's my key argument for the first section. I argue egoistic love is mirroring. The idea that you see yourself mirrored in another person, or at least you see your values and your virtues mirrored in the other. So Rand does not use the term mirroring in her nonfiction, but here's where she comes closest to the idea of mirroring. She usually uses the word embodiment. Mm -hmm. She said that you see your virtues and values embodied in another, but it's a very similar idea, I think. In her speech of living death, she said, quote, romantic love in the full sense of the term is an emotion possible only to the man or woman of unbridged self-esteem. Again, that's the stable I I talked about. It is his response to his own highest values in the person of another. Here we get the idea of mirroring. An integrated response of mind and body of love and sexual desire, end quote. So let me stress that I went through the objectivist literature. I have not found a single objectivist who used the word mirroring. However, Tara Smith, in her book, The Virtuous Egoist, uh, she comes close because she talks about reflection and reflecting often. So she says, loving another person in so far as it reflects valuing is a thoroughly self-interested proposition, end quote. And I think Tara Smith, I mean, we cannot ask, ask her, she is not here, but I think it's the same idea, because ultimately, what does a mirror do? It reflects. So I think it's the same idea. Tara Smith and I are very much on the same page here. And now, I think we already have a clearer understanding of this entire passage, in which Howard Rock, for the first time, tells Dominique that he loves her. It's a very interesting passage for the following reason. In this case, there is no mirroring. Because remember that this is halfway through the novel. Howard Rock knows who he is. He knows his values clearly. He knows his virtues. He fights for them uncompromisingly. And he is based on the benevolent universe premise. He holds that values can be achieved that happiness can be achieved. But at this point in the story, Dominique is still based on the malevolent view of the universe. She thinks that Howard Rock will fail. And consequently, due to this discrepancy, Howard Rock knows who he is. He can say, I love you. He can tell Dominique because he sees her for what she could and should be and what she will become if you finish reading the novel. But at this moment, Dominique cannot work as a mirror or as a reflector. So Howard Rock can express his love for her but it's not reciprocal at this point. Dominique loves him, but she cannot express it. So Howard Rock says, quote, I love you, Dominique, as selfishly as the fact that I exist, as selfishly as my lungs breathe air. I breathe for my own necessity, for the fuel of my body, for my survival. 
I have given you not my sacrifice or my pity, but my ego and my naked need. This is the only way you can wish to be loved. This is the only way I can want you to love me. To say I love you, one must know first how to say the I. End quote. So Howard Rock, at this point in the novel, he has his stable eye. Dominique doesn't have it, or at best, she has lost it. But this is not the only passage I found. It's very interesting. I would like to go back all the way to the beginning to 1936 and have a look at Ayn Rand's very first published love story, the love story between Leo and Kira in We the Living. The first quote here is from the very first encounter between Leo and Kira. So I would like to stress that this is not from somewhere in the middle of the novel. This is Rand's very first love story, and it's the first time that Kira and Leo meet. And the third person narrator says, quote, her, Kira's face, was a mirror for the beauty of his, end quote. So here we have, for the first time, the idea of a mirror. And incidentally, as a side note, it would be a misreading, I think, to only focus on physical beauty here. What we are having here, and I will tell you later why, we will have a look at a romantic manifesto. We are having two souls, two consciousnesses, which react with one another, and which share the same values and virtues. Kira and Leo have a very, very similar code of values, and they have several aims. First of all, they are lovers of life. Second, they have a common purpose. They want to escape Soviet Russia in order to live a human life outside of the USSR. This is what they have in common. However, if you have read the novel, you will know that Leo gradually and very tragically disintegrates. He becomes a gambler, he becomes a woman chaser, he becomes an alcoholic. And ultimately, he no longer has the same values and virtues and Kira. And about halfway through the novel, the third person narrator says the following about Leo, quote, he looked into her, Kira's flaming eyes, with eyes that were like mirrors, which could not reflect the flame any longer. Why bother, he asked, end quote. So here we see the idea that some people might be mirrors, and they might reflect one another and share the same set of values and virtues, which is why they fall in love. But ultimately, if one person changes, the love story is over. Since it would be a bit philosophically lazy to only focus on reader living, just as a side note, Look here, this is what Dagny feels after she had sex with John Gold and Ethel Schrucks for the first time. She feels proud, and why? Quote, that it should be she, Dagny, whom Gold had chosen as his mirror. That it should be her body, which was now giving him the sum of existence, and his body was giving her the sum of hers, end quote. So this idea of mirroring, if you study Rand's text closely, that comes up often, and this is the theory I would like to present and defend here. One more side note before we come to uh, the second part of the presentation. There are a lot of books on Aristotle and a lot of self-declared Aristotelians and experts on Aristotle who argue that Aristotle describes the best friend as a mirror. Now, I would like to stress briefly that this is not true. I went through the entire Aristotelian oeuvre and had a word search. Aristotle never describes a friend as um, a mirror. And I called my friend Carrie Ann Biondi a few days ago, whom some of you I'm sure know, brilliant scholar of Aristotle who also said Aristotle never used the term mirror. However, Aristotle used two terms, namely alos autos and heteros autos, another self or a second self. So Aristotle, like Rand holds, that when it comes to both friendship and love, we see virtues and values, which we ourselves hold embodied in another person. And this is why we start feeling affection towards the other, in whatever degree. So the point here is, again, key takeaway from the first section, we need values and virtues to bring to the marketplace, we need to find them embodied in another person, and then once we have mirrored ourselves, we can start looking to the future, building a future together in the long run, thinking about what values we want to achieve together. And there is a wonderful passage in Atlas Schracht in which Rand expresses that, and I think Aristotle would have agreed fully with this statement, quote, lovers and friends can be only travelers you choose to share your journey, and must be travelers going on their own power in the same direction, end quote. So again, key takeaway, there need to be values and virtues in both the self and the other. Tara Smith states that beautifully and shortly, quote, the egoist will love another person because that person is valuable to him, that's the self, and because of who that person is, that's the other. The latter explains the former, it explains why the egoist values him in particular, end quote. So completely against the idea of indiscriminate love, of loving everybody without many, making any differences. So let's come to the second part. How does such a virtuous love look like in practice? Once we have found someone who mirrors our values, our virtues, how does it look like? Just to give you an impression, and again, I will get away with two misconceptions, the idea that love is instrumental, it is not, and the idea that it is a zero-sum game, it is not. 
Just to get my definition straight here, zero-sum game is a term from economic theory. There are two differently opposed viewpoints. On the one hand, the positive sum game theory, this is the one which rent upholds, which means that if we engage in a trade, we can both profit from it. And on the other hand, there's the zero-sum game theory, or I would call it zero-sum game fallacy, which means that if we trade, one person must necessarily lose at the expense of another. So this is not how love should be treated. Both parties should win, and they can in an egoistic relationship, which might sound paradoxical at first. But first, let me get one misconception out of the way. Out of, up to now, I have mostly talked about love, and now suddenly I'm bringing in Aristotle and friendship. So can you do that in one lecture? And I will argue certainly you can, because when we look at love and friendship, this is not a difference in kind. Those are not two fundamentally different ideas. This is a difference in degree. And Rand points that out in Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. She writes, quote, let us answer the question, can you measure love? The concept love is formed by isolating two or more instances of the appropriate psychological process, then retaining its distinguishing characteristics. An emotion proceeding from the evaluation of an existence as a positive value and as a source of pleasure, and omitting the object and the measurements of the process's intensity, end quote. So just have a look at the picture I have here. So you can love different stuff. There's all kinds of different stuff you can love. You can love, for instance, an event. You could say, wow, this was a lovely party. You could love an object. You could say, I'm in love with this statue, for instance, which is standing next to my bed. You could be in love with an animal. A lot of people love their pets. And you can also be in love with human beings. And again, the intensity differs between a friend and, on the other hand, your romantic lover. So for instance, if we talk about the party example, you might be here, there might be not much intensity. You might say, that was a lovely evening. I met two people whom I like, but who are only acquaintances. I talked with them for one hour. So there's not so much intensity. But if we talk about objects, it's probably a bit more, for the most part, because it's much more stable. You go to a party, it was one nice hour, you have a lot of parties, but if you have an object which is very valuable to you, I think you have more intensity. And again, probably when we focus on pets, probably we are somewhere here for most people. And the reason should be obvious, because if you have a statue, again, that's inanimate matter. It cannot re reciprocate. A cat, to a certain degree, can, because it's also conscious. And then I think when it comes to the highest forms of friendship, we are somewhere here. And there are a lot of people who, on my, well, on my hierarchy of love, are here, because this is like a very intense feeling, and I love some people here who are in the audience. And this, I think, is how friendship should be treated. However, romantic love is one degree more. This is really the highest form of intensity, so I think this is really here. And I would say that this last point, the highest level of intensity, this is exclusively for your one romantic partner. So I know, of course, there are other models these days where people live together with more than one person as their love interest, but on the objectivist view, you should only have one. No, but this is the idea, generally speaking. And of course, you can change there. Let me give you one example to clarify that. So there's one person in this room whom I love very much, and this is Annie Wintersense. So where is Annie Wintersense on this spectrum? Well, for instance, five years ago, she was not on the spectrum at all, because the reason is I did not know her yet, because I've only collaborated with I, Annie for four years. But the point is, when I met her four years ago and we started talking, she was probably somewhere here, of course, because I had a very nice impression, but that was it. So I started to feel being affected. And then over the years, over those four years, we went up to here, because we collaborated a lot, and I think I can say we developed a strong bond of trust. So Annie right now is in my orange zone here, and I hope if she also has such a barometer, I'm also into her orange zone. But the point here is, Annie could never get to that red zone. And the reason is pretty obvious, because I have not been romantically involved with Annie, nor will I ever be. So this is why I think the orange zone is the maximum. Very sorry if I disappointed you, Annie. OK. <laughs> Good, so that, now we have all the misconceptions out of the way, so we can also focus on friendship. And Aristotle differentiates among three forms of friendship, and while Rand was primarily focused on romantic love, Aristotle primarily was focused on friendship, but we can translate those ideas of friendship to the realm of love, I would say. So Aristotle says there are two forms of friendship which are imperfect. The first one would be friendship of utility. Which means, for instance, you meet someone, you have no idea whether they really share all your values or virtues, but you have a common aim. For instance, I might be in favor of capitalism, I meet someone from another continent who's also in favor of capitalism, we have different strengths, we've collaborated. That might be a friendly enterprise and there's nothing wrong with that, but such a relationship is not stable because once you have achieved your purpose, 
that's usually it, because you don't know whether the other person represents values or virtues. I think we can translate that into the realm of love because you often have those kind of arrangements which cannot be properly considered love, where two people do one thing for one another, like both benefit somehow, but they don't have any spiritual connection, so it doesn't work in the long run. Then we have the second imperfect form of friendship, which again we can translate. That is the friendship of pleasure. So you are still young, for probably when you turned 18, you remember you liked going to clubs and you knew some people who also liked celebrating. So you had some drinks together, you went dancing, but that was it. Those relationships are also not stable because it's only for pleasure and usually people evolve out of that after time, or at least they should. And again, we can translate that to another realm, the realm of love. And what we see there is we see people who are getting together just for sex. But there is no spiritual connection, so also this is a very unstable form. So Aristotle describes these two forms as following. He writes, quote, those who love because of utility love because of what is good for themselves. And those who love because of pleasure do so because of what is pleasant to themselves. And not because of who the loved person is. Um, but in so far as he is useful or pleasant, end quote. So in this case, there is no reflection because there is no identification, first and foremost, of the other as a virtue or as a value. This is the problem. The identification is missing, and consequently, there can be no reflection or mirroring. It's completely different in the perfect form of friendship, which Aristotle describes as follows. He says, quote, perfect friendship is the friendship of men who are good and alike in virtue. So here we have someone who's alike in virtue. We have identified that. For these wish well alike to each other qua good, because they are good, and they are good in themselves. Now those who wish well to their friends for their sake are most truly friends, for they do this by reason of own nature, because they see the other as a virtue and want to do that for the other. And not incidentally, therefore their friendship lasts as long as they are good, and goodness is an enduring thing. So this is the idea, and I think here again, Rand is much closer with Aristotle than probably she herself realized. But the point is now, how does such a love, be it a stable, good, perfect friendship, or romantic love in the fullest sense of the word. How does it look like? And to understand that first, we need to get another misconception out of the way, and I will be very brief here because I trust you uh, discussed that in the John Gold schools. What is selfishness? Because Rand's idea of rational selfishness clashes completely with traditional notions and I would say perversions of selfishness. When you think about a selfish person, most people will tell you this is someone who manipulates others, who would even kill to get his way through. This is not Rand's idea. Rand's idea is be concerned with your own rational self-interest. Think about what is an important, rational, independently chosen value for you, and then give it form. So she points out, quote, the exact meaning and dictionary definition of the word selfishness is concerned with one's own interests, end quote. So the point here is, if you have the traditional idea, which is a wrong idea, of selfishness, of exploiting others, what you end up in a relationship is this a very toxic one in which one tries to rule and exploit the others. So this is not what Rand means by selfish love. Quite the opposite. A selfish love is a love in which you are happy because you know that the other person shares your values. So you want the other person to be happy because they contribute to your happiness. So why do we fall in love? One falls in love, Ayn Rand writes in the Romantic Manifesto, with the embodiment of the values that form a person's character which are reflected in his widest goals or smallest gestures, which create the style of his soul, the individual style of a unique, unrepeatable, irreplaceable consciousness." End quote. So if you are a rational egoist, you want your partner to be happy, because if you mistreat them, they might lose you. And if they really value, that is not what is in your rational, long-term interest. And Rand points that out very clearly in the Ethics of Emergencies. She writes, quote, the practical implementation of friendship, affection, and love, so here she also brings together friendship and love, as I did, consists of incorporating the welfare, the rational welfare, of the person involved into one's own hierarchy of values, then acting accordingly, end quote. So once you have identified someone as a value, you should treat them nicely, if they are real values and if you want to keep them in their life. So love is not instrumental. Selfish love is not instrumental. It's not about using other people. It's about achieving happiness together. Once you have found the right uh, framework, by finding common virtues and values. And there's a very interesting passage in Rand Journals. And this is when she came up with the idea of the fountainhead. The fountainhead was not yet published, so Ayn Rand thought about the character of Rourke. How should Rourke be like? And she noted to herself, quote, when he, Rourke, likes a person, he likes him for that man's own sake, not for what he, Rourke, can get from that man, end quote. 
So again, it's completely against the idea of instrumentality. So a lot of people think that Rand was thinking in instrumental terms when it comes to all kinds of stuff. It's a complete misreading of Ayn Rand. And Tara Smith also points that out in this very important uh, passage. She writes, quote, the contention that the egoist, because he's primarily committed to his own well-being, cannot value anything other than that, fails to understand Rand's view of the relationship between values and life. The numerous values that sustain a person's life could seem merely instrumental only if one accepted an artificial separation between life and values. In fact, in seeking to promote his own life, what the egoist seeks is a world of values." End quote. And the point here is Aristotle has a very interesting example. He says, if I have identified the other, my best friend, as another self, and if that friend gets hurt, or worse, I hurt my friend accidentally, I will feel pain myself. And I myself feel that way, and maybe some of you have felt that way, because by introspecting you can see if someone you like suffers, especially if you have made a mistake, then you feel bad about it. So you can see it's not in your own self-interest, because if you hurt people you love, you will feel bad yourself. So your rational self-interest demands of you, if you want to achieve happiness, that you treat those who are of value to you, most importantly your friends or your romantic partner, in a good, beneficial way. And this leads us to the second misconception. Love is not a zero-sum game. That very much focus, uh, follows when we have understood that love is not instrumental. So let us first get an idea here. What is the zero-sum game fallacy? It's based on another fallacy. Here, the fallacy of the fixed pie. Now in economic terms, what does that mean? It's a very Marxist idea again. It is the idea that the size of the economy is fixed. A certain amount of wealth has already been created. And as Karl Marx put it, the uh, the problem of production has been solved. So now we only need to focus on redistributing because in the economy there is a certain amount of wealth. Well, in such a case, if this were true, which it is not, if, for instance, you have a certain amount of wealth and some businessman takes away what seems to be 25% in this uh, pie diagram, then there are only 75% left. And then we need to redistribute it for the rest of the people. This is economically completely flawed, and it has been shown several times that it is wrong. And why is that so? Because if you leave the businessmen free to produce, if they have the freedom and the liberty to create innovations, then the pie will get bigger and bigger, and consequently everyone will profit. Well, the same is true of love. If you have a zero-sum game approach to love, you would say, well, everyone only has a certain capacity to love. So for instance, I would later go out with my friend Leopold and we would have a drink and he would show me some affection in a non-sexual way. Then again, there would only be 90% left, which he could give to other people for the rest of the day. That's a nonsensical idea because the point here is that love is a positive sum game. The more love there is in the world, the bigger the pie gets, the more love we have. Rand writes in the so-called conflicts of man's interest, quote, like any other value, love is not a static quantity to be divided, not a fixed pie but an unlimited response to be earned. The love for one friend is not a threat to the love for another, and neither is the love for the various members of one's family, assuming they have all earned it." End quote. And why is that so? If you are a good example, if you show other people what love is about, if you treat other people nicely, they may do that also in their own life. So there are more lovers in the world, and the world will become a better place at large. So now we already had some look at some economic theory. Let's do some more, and let's really start constantly, consistently developing together an economic approach to love. So again, we will focus on risk and on trade. So I'll always first focus on economics and then I will translate it to the realm of love. But before that again, values and virtues are spiritual currencies on my view. And why is that the case? Well, if we focus on economic transactions, what we do is we bring products to the marketplace, products and services. Now today, of course, when you go to a marketplace, you usually, when you buy a product, you pay with money. But it's important to remember that, properly speaking, money represents goods and services which have already been produced. Rand discusses that at length in Egalitarianism and Inflation, which was anthologized in Philosophy Who Needs It. So money, again, properly speaking, it is a representative for goods and services which have already been produced. So not as today when you start printing money all the time. So the point here is, ultimately, those coins represent something, a good or a value. But earlier in barter societies, what we did when it was more clear is we went to the marketplace and we exchanged one product for another. So that was the original idea. And the same applies for the marketplace of love. We need to bring values and virtues there. And then other people need to offer us values and virtues. 
And while in the economic sphere we can strike a deal, on the marketplace for love and friendship, we can have a match, as we say today. So Peikoff writes, quote, the objectivist does not say, I value only myself. He says, if you are a certain kind of person, by which he means if you represent values and virtues, you become thereby a value to me in the furtherance of my own life and happiness, end quote. But it's only in this way, if the other person is a certain kind of person, that you can make that trade, that you can make that deal. Because otherwise, I will show you in a second, it will lead to disaster. And I will not read all the other quotes out, just maybe one, and then we will focus on what I put in italics. But the language which Rand uses in her books is very telling. So first in Atlas Schracht, when she discusses the virtue of justice, she writes, quote, your moral appraisal is the coin paying man for the virtues of Isis. And this payment demands of you as scrupulous an honor as you bring to financial mm -hmm. transactions, end quote. Similar later in Atlas Shrugged when she talks about an emotional price which one has to pay for the joy one receives from the virtues of another. And similarly, in the objectivist ethics, she describes love as a spiritual payment which has to be paid. So that terminology is always there. So now let us talk about goods. As I said, if you are, for instance, a businessman, what you need to do is you need to bring goods, physical goods, to the market. But on the marketplace, there is risk involved in at least two factors. And one of them concerns the self, and the other one concerns the other. Let's focus on that, then we will translate it into the realm of love. So the point here is, I am a businessman. I need to bring something valuable to the marketplace. Let us say that I have, for instance, invented a new nutrient, which I feel, I don't think, but I feel it will help the people. But it comes to the marketplace and it turns out to be poisonous. Everyone who takes it will die after 24 hours. Well, then I will go to prison pretty quickly and rightly so. So when I bring a product to the marketplace, I better make sure that it is a good product. But at the same time, there's also risk involved when it comes to the other. Because the other also needs to appreciate my product. Let us say that you live in a very static society, in an irrational society, where people want to stagnate. And you bring, objectively speaking, great innovation, the greatest ever. Well, it doesn't help you very much, because it will not be appreciated by the people. Think about equality, maybe, an anthem who reinvents the light, and the people prefer the candles. So the point is, on the marketplace, you need to bring goods to the market, which are valuable, and people need to recognize that potential. But there is risk involved, and the same applies to the marketplace of love. When I come to that marketplace, I better make sure that I represent values and virtues consistently, and I also need to be careful with the other, because someone else might fake it and show you they have values and virtues, but actually they don't. So there is risk involved when it comes to the self and the other. But this is a very negative outlook, I think. What is better is to focus on opportunity, because wherever there is risk, there is also opportunity. Those are really two sides of the same coin. Tara Smith points it out. She writes, quote, given that human beings are not omniscient about the future, Angel discussed that, or able to control other people's actions, the rational pursuit of one's interests demands that a person make investments of various sorts. It is in the nature of investments that their ultimate fruit is not known in advance. Friendship is one such investment, and so is love, incidentally. Not every possible friendship is worth pursuing. Because of the tremendous value that good friendships can offer, however, some of them are the rational egoist will realize that some risks are worth taking because they are in his interest, end quote. So yes, it's risky to play on the marketplace for love and friendship, but what's the alternative? Alternative would be sitting down, not seeking values anymore. It's very much the idea of the malevolent universe premise and just giving up. But in this way, you cannot achieve any value. So risk is necessary if you want to fulfill your potential and find the right kind of people. So this is the crucial point here. But again, we cannot control others, obviously, because they have free will. They might be fakers. But it's important, at least, what we can control is that we bring goods, valuable goods, to the marketplace. So when it comes to the marketplace of love, we better make sure that we represent values and virtues. But the question then, of course, is what if I realize that maybe I am flawed? This is what Rand talks about in the interview. Well, in such a case, before going to that marketplace, you should work on yourself, I think. You should clearly identify your values and virtues, practice them consistently, and then try to find someone whom you can mirror with. This is the idea. But the point here is what is impossible, and now I show you the disastrous example of what happens if you don't do that, is if you, when you go to the marketplace, and that you know that you have a lot of flaws and failures, and you are unwilling to correct them. If you go there, in effect, as a fake, and if you think, I might have some good sex for some time, and somehow I can fake myself around into a relationship. 
because there is a character in Atlas Shrugged who tries to do that. That is James Taggart. And he ultimately portrays himself as embodying values and virtues. But his wife, Cheryl, finds out that he doesn't have any values or virtues whatsoever. That was all a facade. But despite that, Jim still wants to be loved. He says to Cheryl, quote, to be loved for, so you think that love is a matter of mathematics, of exchange, of waving and measuring, like a pound of butter on a grocery counter. I don't want to be loved for anything. I want to be loved for myself, not for anything I do or have or say or think. For myself, not for my body or mind or words or works or actions. Cheryl then asks, but then what is yourself, end quote. And that leads us back to the beginning, to Aristotle's theory of motion. Because the point here is that Jim somehow thinks he can get love out there and he can be loved, but the self is missing. There is no I. This is a completely selfless idea of love. We are literally having an empty shell here. We are having nothing inside. We might have something which might look beautiful from the outside, but if you come closer to that person, you will realize that he or she is merely an empty shell. So this is not how love can be treated because everyone needs to have a stable self, a stable I. So this leads us to my ultimate point, and then I have one more slide just to show you the positive, because as many of you know, I always end on the positive. But here, what is perfect friendship and perfect love about? Well, it's about seeking an equilibrium here. So what we have, need to have a look at here is the model of supply and demand. So when we focus on economics, what do we mean by that? Well, there are suppliers, businessmen, for instance, who bring products to the market. But at the same time, there are, of course, consumers who buy stuff from the market. And what an economic theory we want to reach is an equilibrium, which means that the quantity supplied equals the quantity demanded. That is the idea. Otherwise, we get problems. If quantity supplied exceeds quantity demanded, then we have a surplus. On the other hand, and I think, well, both a surplus and a shortage are not perfect, but I think the shortage is the worst one, this would mean that we don't have enough quantity supplied. So quantity demanded would exceed quantity supplied, as we saw in many communist countries where millions of people starved to death, tragically. Yet as we will see when we now focus on the market shift for friendship of love, we will see that both a surplus and a shortage will be deadly for the relationship. You need to have equilibrium. Why is that? Let us have a look at Peikoff's quote. I will go through the first part and then analyze it, then I will have the second one. Peikoff writes, quote, to give a person less than he deserves, judging by one's own hierarchy, is to betray one's values. So this would be the idea of a shortage. So I have mirrored someone and I'm in a relationship now, but I realize that the other person consistently brings more to the table than I do. So there is a shortage from my side. This cannot work out in the long run because the other person will realize that he or she brings much more to the table, has more investments into that relationship, and they will leave me. And again, if I really love that person, if that person is a value to me, I better make sure that I reciprocate that because I need that person in my life. On the other hand, to give someone more is to divert resources to a recipient who is unworthy of them by one's own definitions and thus again to sacrifice one's values." End quote. So here we are at the idea of a surplus. I am bringing more values and virtues to the table than my partner. Well, this is also not working in the long run. This is not stable. Because if I'm a rational person, I will realize that. If the other person doesn't change, I will leave. But on the other hand, if I am somewhat irrational, as many people are, and just stay in that relationship because I hope that something changes, but nothing changes because my partner doesn't want to understand me because he's a Jim Taggart, I will probably be passive aggressive and that ultimately ends in complete chaos and in a toxic relationship. So either a surplus or a shortage from whatever side are not working. Peikoff writes, quote, a man must deserve what he seeks from others. He can deserve it only by earning it, only by creating the values of character that make his relationship with others a trait, end quote. So only in this way, by building our character, finding our character reflected in the other and bringing the same amount of spiritual goods to the market, can we have a stable relationship. Now just one more side note, just to make sure that we don't have any misconception here. When we talk about equilibrium, we think about the long run. Because remember that the cardinal virtue in the objectivist ethics is rationality, which means A, being reality oriented, and B, thinking in the long run. And that's the important thing here. When you talk about the relationships, about highest forms of friendship, and about romantic love, what we mean is that we want to have people with whom we want to be together for the rest of our lives. 
So we have to think long run. And this is why Rand said in the interview that you shouldn't go home at the end of the day and say, how much have you done for me today? How much have I done for you? Let's compare that. No, it's a long run project. And sometimes person A might feel depressed and person B gives more than person A. But then person B might get ill and then person A needs to do more. So it's a long term project and there are periods of giving and taking. Tara Smith points that out, I hadn't thought about it, I found it in her book. She wrote, the self-interested character of a relationship is compatible with periods of more giving and getting. What is important is the overall benefit of the friendship, which can only be measured from a long range, all things considered perspective, end quote. So I showed you the love scene, or the so-called love scene, or the tragic love scene, with James Taggart. So I want to end on a positive note about how love should be treated and how it is reflected. It's from late in the novel, also from Atlas Shrugged. It's from a dialogue between Hank Reardon and Dagny Taggart. And Hank Reardon, as many of you know, is a very conflicted character because he has two codes of morality. One, which is the right one, he applies in his business, but a wrong one, which he applies in his personal life. And this is why he is trapped with his wife throughout most of the story, and they don't love each other. And Hank can also not express his own love for Dagny because he has not found himself yet. It is only when he found himself that he can express love properly speaking. And he says, quote, I love you as the same value, as the same expression, with the same pride and the same meaning as I love my work, my mills, my metal, my, my, home, my hours at a desk, at a furnace, in a laboratory, in an ore mine. And I love my ability to work. As I love the act of sight and knowledge, as I love the action of my mind when it solves a chemical equation or grasps the sunrise, as I love the things I've made and the things I've felt, as my product, as my choice, as the shape of my world, as my best mirror, as that which makes all the rest possible, as my power to live. Thank you. Okay, so we have 15 minutes left, I think, but we started a bit late, but I'm ready for questions now. But it's good, we started late, so we're exactly on time now, right? Yeah. Okay, good. There are no questions. If you have any questions, you can't talk to me. How to become a speaker like you? <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate it. But you didn't answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> I have thought this through for so long, you know, that I was really expecting those questions. So that comes out of nothing. So first of all, I don't consider myself a perfect speaker. I think I'm much better at writing than I am at speaking, actually. But thanks for the compliment again. I would say the point is if you want to become a good speaker, of course, you can have an entire class on that. But the point is, I think, you need to do your research well, you need to focus, you need to have a certain structure which you can follow. But then when you go on stage, and that's the most important thing, trust your subconscious. Because you cannot have a plan and follow a plan because if you lose the red thread, that will be the end of the presentation that ends in breakthroughs on stage. Now you have to have a certain kind of repertoire and then you look at the audience and you just see what works, what doesn't work and you then spontaneously go with your subconscious and decide what you want to talk about or not. I have a question. Uh, can you please tell us a little bit about uh, love between parents and children and should children love their parents and should parents love their children? Okay, that's a very, very good question. Yes, we should have focused on that too. So first of all, before I answer the question, let me stress emphatically that on the objectivist view, there is no such thing as a need for having children. That's a completely optional issue. So first you need to decide, do you want to have children, yes or no? I think that is where the starting point is. So on the objectivist view, it's perfectly fine to have children or not to have children, as long as you have rational reasons for your decision. But it would be irrational and immoral on the objectivist view to say, I will have a child, I don't want it, but my mother wants me to have a child, so I will do it. Or the other way around. So that would be going against your own self-interest. But I think, yes, that you have, if the term <coughs> duty makes any sense, and I just don't think it does. But if it makes any sense, then it's forward a child. Because I think that up to a certain point, you have a responsibility for your child. And you should love it, yes. Of course, there are other ter terrible instances. We could get into the whole abortion debate, but let us say that someone really doesn't know that she is pregnant and she is pregnant due to rape. I can understand why in such extreme cases a woman could not love the child. That I understand. But other than those very extreme cases which don't happen very often, then yes, I think you have a responsibility towards your child and you should love it, most certainly. 
But again, it depends. First, make the decision whether or not you want to have one. Because if you make that decision clearly, there will be a lot more loving parents in the world. Thank you. So I think that the representatives in this room are from many countries where it's the norm that you know you're brought up with self, you know, unselfish love and unconditional love and all these definitions of love that are tied to some sort of altruism or selflessness. So how do how do we approach others? I mean. You know, it would be great to find someone who share our understanding and our values and our virtues. But how can you, without coming in and transforming, wanting to transform that person, how can you create an awareness in others that you might have a crush on or something, that there are these values, and how can you make them interested in seeing that there are these values that take that love or friendship to a higher level? Well, I will again. Take the uh, question from a slightly different angle, but I will get there. So first of all, we need to see, it might be better if there are more objectivists in the world who share our values. So first of all, it's an intellectual battle. Because just as love is not a zero-sum game, knowledge is not a zero-sum game. It's not that if I give knowledge to someone, I lose it myself. So if you spread that philosophy more, if you spread rational ideas, there will be more people whom you can find, whom you can mirror. So that is the first thing I would say. But other than that, given the context it is now, I would say, well, we have to take a risk. That's the first thing. We do not know the other person for sure, so she should be careful. But if we see that someone shares many of our values or virtues and is open for discussion, then we can slowly guide them there, not by forcing them, but by saying, for instance, wow, this is a great book. I was dating someone who had not heard about Rand, but whom I know was fascinated throughout their entire life with both architecture and railroads. So I thought that might be a perfect match, and I met the person and I gave them at the shrub and the fountain end. So that is how I would start such a discourse. Yeah, Paul. Uh, Norman, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, very interesting. I, I want to ask you about the quote in order to say, I love you, one must know how to say the I. Yeah. Right? So do you see another angle uh, in addition to everything you developed here about the importance of, so, so you have one aspect, discovering your eye and shaping that eye, but another one is really finding a way to articulate that expression, right? So can you say something about that, like how to say the eye? That's a tough one, to be honest. That's probably the toughest question I've ever gotten in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> At least after giving lectures in the Q&A periods. No, but uh, I think you answered it in a way yourself, didn't you? I, fully, I didn't fully get it then, but the point is, first of all, you need to know who you are. And then you can express those values. For instance, let us say that, let's take a very simple example. Let us say you have knowledge. Then that is the first point. In order to transmit knowledge, first you need to have it. So first you need to be focused on the eye. But then, of course, you need to express it. So maybe it's a difference of content and method what we are dealing with here. But it's always that method comes later. First, I need to acquire the content. And then, for instance, I can give that to another person. That will be, of course, an example from the epistemological realm. But first, I figure out the content. And then, form follows function, as Rob often says in the fountainhead. And then, I need to learn how to apply it. And what we always need to do, we need the context. This is important. And I think the same goes for this idea of love. Because this is how why I talk. Let me just get back to that, to the idea of intensity. Once we figure out who we self are, then we need to think about how we apply that in different situations. And certainly, I will give less love to my postman than I give to my best friend, you know? So it depends on the context, and it depends on how much you want to invest into that person. And again, now the idea of risk plays in. So you need to think fully, logically, clearly, consistently, rationally, and figure out how much potential that person has. Of course, you're not omniscient, you might go wrong, but overall I would give people the benefit of the doubt, and given the time that you have, I would invest that in that person, even though it might fail. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, taking in account what you say about that the love is not uh, person, and also that uh, to fall in love in the maximum level in one person, you have to have a Yes. Is possible, impossible due to the objectivism? 
So first of all, then I was not clear. When I was saying that I was with Annie, then I said Annie and I, we developed briefly from here to here. But I don't think that in a relationship, in a romantic sense of relationship, that this is the case, because we have something like love at first sight, which I think is compatible with the objective's view, because if you read Rand's novels, the characters see each other reflected immediately. That's a typical theme of all of her novels, which you can find in all of them. So probably when you meet someone and you see his overall style, the style of his soul, it immediately goes from here to here. And then you need to figure out, are we really here? Is the person real or is it a fake? This is why I showed you, incidentally, this quote here from the Romantic Manifesto. There Ron talk, talks about it. She says, what falls in love with the embodiment of the values that form the person's character. And what she really means is that we fall in love quite quickly because we see that soul reflected in a person's manner, in their movement. So that is why we have the phenomenon of love at first sight, which is compatible with the objectivist view, but it's just not a mystical sense. Did that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, good, thanks. All right. So thanks again for showing up for the presentation and thank you.